side yet. Um, just to make sure you're in the right place. This is the CSIS Careers and Development series, and with me today is Les Munson. And I don't know if you've read his, his background. He spent 25, 30 years on Capitol Hill working for Senator Corker, Senator Kirk, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was a Deputy Assistant Administrator in USAID. And so has an enormous amount of experience on, on Capitol Hill and dealing with the political side of development and development assistance. And now he's the Vice President for International Affairs? Yes, sir. For BGR? Yes. Does that stand for anything? Uh, BGR uh, used to be called Barbara Griffith Rogers, which are the names of the three guys ah. who started the, the consulting and lobbying firm 25, 26 years ago. Ah. And now that's uh, 21st century, so they became BGR. Ah, okay. I was just curious. Without further ado, let me turn it over to you, and Les is going to talk a little bit about the intersection of, of uh, Capitol Hill and uh, international assistance in all its various aspects. So, Les, over to you. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope this is valuable. Uh, uh, I will, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my career uh, and some of the things that uh, I was fortunate enough to do while I was on the Hill and at AID, and then um, a couple of thoughts on kind of the uh, political situation generally, and then also kind of the current, uh, current issues that are facing development and assistance broadly with the new administration and things that Congress may or may not be doing in the near future. So um, <clears throat> so I'll talk about myself for a little bit, forgive me. Uh, I got involved in, to the extent I was involved in international development, it's because I was involved in politics and policy. Uh, and I initially became interested in American politics and policy when I interned for my congressman, uh, who was a guy named Henry Hyde from the suburbs of Chicago. He was my hometown congressman. Uh, and I learned about interning for your congressman by reading Rolling Stone magazine, and they used to have uh, a thing called the hot issue. I don't know if they still do. And the hot job for the summer was to intern with your congressman. And so I read that and I thought, oh, who's my congressman? Uh, so it turned out to be this guy, Henry Hyde, who uh, was of certain stature here in DC. He was a Republican. Uh, he was on, that summer was the summer of 1987. I know that seems impossibly long ago to some of you, but it was just uh, a little while ago to me sounds, and probably Bill. Really yeah. Uh, and in the summer of 1987 was the Iran-Contra hearings, uh, which were investigating these allegations that President Reagan had um, essentially traded uh, missiles to the Iranians in exchange for some money that he used to fund the Contras in Nicaragua. It was a Cold War uh, thing, if uh, you guys are not as familiar with that as we are up here. Um, and it was fascinating. Uh, Henry Hyde was on TV every day. Uh, they had these public hearings on C-SPAN, and uh, Oliver North was involved, and Fawn Hall, and all of these celebrities, and it was a scandal, and it was foreign policy, and there was actually some aid issues involved. Uh, it was terrifically interesting. I fell in love with Washington, uh, and I was fortunate enough to get a job working for Henry Hyde when I graduated from college a couple years later. <clears throat> I worked for him for five years. I was a legislative assistant. I was his press secretary. Uh, and then I went to work on the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, for Hyde's good friend, Ben Gilman, who was a much more liberal Republican. Hyde was kind of a mainstream or conservative Republican. Ben Gilman was about as liberal a Republican as you could get at the time. I worked for Ben Gilman for seven years. I worked on Africa issues, uh, and I was his communications director on the committee. Later, uh, from there, I went to work for a guy named Jesse Helms, who some of you may have heard of, who was about as conservative a Republican as you could find from North Carolina. He was the ranking Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I was his communications person. And then uh, for about a year, I worked on development issues for him and assistance issues, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, after I worked for Henry Hyde, a guy named, or excuse me, after I worked for Helms, uh, Helms retired. It was his last two years that I was working for him in the Senate. And a senator named Richard Luger took over the committee, uh, and he fired all of us. <laughs> uh, I think technically laid us off, which uh, is how I ended up at the U.S. Agency for International Development in the Bush administration, where I worked on um, in public affairs. I worked on global health issues, and eventually uh, headed up the legislative affairs uh, function in LPA, if you know what that is, uh, as the Deputy Assistant Administrator, which was uh, a terrific window on everything that, that USAID is doing. After that, I went to work for my old friend who was a congressman named Mar uh, Mark Kirk. Uh, he ran for Senate after a guy named Barack Obama got elected president. He left this opening in the Senate. Mark ran for, the, for that uh, Senate seat. He won. 
Uh, I worked for him for a couple of years in the Senate, and then I switched to working for Bob Corker at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee again. This time I was the staff director. Uh, we got a little bit involved in some development issues, uh, and then I retired from the Hill a couple of years ago, and now I'm a lobbyist and a consultant. Uh, one of my clients is the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, which does, a, I think, an amazing job of advocating for a robust foreign assistance budget. It's, it's actually a huge privilege for me to even be working with them. I'd probably do it for free, but they actually pay us money to help them, which is really nice. Um, uh, so that's, that's my career in a nutshell. I, I'd, I'd tease out some things for those of you who are um, thinking about your careers and what, and what you're looking at, and what, what can you do in a place like Congress that might relate to development assistance. Um, I had at least a couple of experiences that I think uh, affected me a lot, and I think, we're, and I think actually mattered in the world of, of development. Um, one funny story, uh, as I was, at, when I was working on um, uh, Africa issues on the House Foreign Affairs Committee for Ben Gilman, uh, a, this was in the 90s during the Clinton administration, when Republicans were running Congress and where there was, again, budget cuts and Democrats were defending higher funding levels, Republicans were for lower levels, and uh, and it was, it was some turmoil, not really that different than today, and um, frankly. And uh, at one point, there was, there was a program in Zimbabwe called uh, the Campfire Program, which uh, was run by USAID. And the Campfire Program, the central purpose was to give, was to help uh, local communities deal with elephants that were causing problems in their communities. There was an abundance of elephants in Zimbabwe, and one of the things that happened through the campfire program was local communities could sell hunting licenses to hunters for a lot of money to come in and kill an elephant. And, the, and you would cull the herd a little bit, which was, had a salutary impact on the environment. The local economy would make a little money. Now, the U.S. Humane Society found out about this and realized it was a huge uh, opportunity for them. So they... Uh, found uh, a, an old Hollywood actress, and I'm forgetting her name, forgive me, who, and they asked her, uh, she was affiliated with the Humane Society somehow, and she came in to meet Ben Gilman to stop this campfire program. Of course, Ben Gilman's my boss, I have to staff this meeting. And, uh, and this actress came in and explained to Ben Gilman how terrible it was that you know, we were killing, essentially the US taxpayer was funding the killing of elephants. And, uh, and I had written a memo explaining kind of the AID logic of why you would have this campfire program, you know, and it was, had these positive impacts, and here's why it was doing it. And, and the actress said to Ben Gilman, she said, Ben, they're killing the symbol of our party. And Ben Gilman, ben Gilman looked at me and he said, Les, we're killing the symbol of our party. And I said, that's right, we're gonna try and stop this program, sir. Um, so that was, that was a pretty good uh, interface of politics, PR, advocacy, lobbying, and development assistance on the Hill. Uh, that's the funny story. The more heartwarming story, I think, is actually when I was working for Jesse Helms, who a lot of people see as this um, uh, very conservative fellow, right winger, uh, who was always for, uh, he referred to aid money as a black hole. He was an opponent of uh, family planning programs. There's a lot of truth to all of that. While I worked for him, he uh, changed his mind on AIDS around the world and realized that, in fact, it should be part of the U.S. It's, it was in the U.S. interest to fight the scourge of AIDS, which was just then emerging as kind of a global threat, particularly in Africa and some other, and some other places. And while I was working for him, we developed uh, something called the... Uh, Mother to Child Transmission Program, MTCT, and we, uh, we managed to devote, I think it was $500 million to a national program at aid and state that would address uh, the transmission of the HIV virus from mothers to children. Uh, and, this, and this kind of, um, this was in uh, 2001, 2002. This was the predecessor to President Bush's PEPFAR program, which, was actu which actually happened after Helms had retired. But it, uh, you know, I was there when Helms, and, and a lot of credit goes to uh, the lead singer for U2, Bono, who spent a lot of time with Helms and other conservative Republicans speaking their language, talking about why something like the scourge of HIV actually should matter. He would use Bible verses. He would sit there with them and talk about it for hours on end. Uh, I once referred to Bono as having an iron butt uh, as, as Helms' communications director, meaning he could sit there through a four-hour meeting uh, and still be effective. Uh, and so, so to be there at kind of the beginning of the U.S. response to the, to the HIV crisis, which really 
in the end, even if it was a little late, saved a generation uh, or more in, in a lot of places in Africa and elsewhere, frankly. Uh, and so the opportunity to work on that on Capitol Hill was um, really one of the most amazing things that, that I've ever done. And if I don't do anything else, uh, I'll feel like at least I've made some sort of contribution. Um, uh, I did have a terrific opportunity at AID uh, in the Bush administration when a lot of these uh, bigger programs were being implemented. I was in the Global Health Bureau uh, as a political appointee uh, helping uh, develop PEPFAR and uh, the focus countries and making sure that those things were implemented, at least from the AID perspective, in an effective way. Ultimately, uh, one, of, one of my key roles in the Global Health Bureau, by the way, and later on in LPA was to, was to take all the criticism from Republicans of the Bush administration policy, which they didn't think was conservative enough or tough enough, particularly on family planning or some of the methods that were used to prevent HIV transmission. Some of you may recall that the ABC method, which stood for uh, abstinence, be faithful, and condoms, uh, which was the Bush administration approach, and there was a lot of evidence that abstinence and be faithful programs were effective. There was a lot of evidence that condoms were effective. So the Bush administration did all of those. Uh, the joke in Washington being, um, if you know anything about the way Washington is laid out, there's an A street and a C street. There is no B street in Washington. So you could talk about abstinence and condoms, but being faithful was a little foreign to uh, inside the Beltway folks. Thank you for laughing. Um, it's hard to make jokes about being faithful. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but, I wanted, but my job essentially at AID as a political appointee in the Bush administration was to talk to other Republicans on the Hill who were concerned about the, con the condoms. And, and there, uh, there were still some folks who are in this country and they're represented in Congress who are a little skeptical of using condoms, uh, I'm, I'm being gentle here, of using condoms either for family planning or as a method of preventing HIV transmission. And so one of my jobs was to kind of go up to the Hill and catch those spears with folks, uh, which again, it was not a lot of fun, but I think it served an important purpose and helped advance a program that really made a difference in people's lives abroad, millions of people. Um, give me one second. So I'd also like to talk a little bit about the current situation uh, that, that faces us in Washington right now. We have a new administration. President Trump didn't talk a lot about assistance issues during the campaign, but since he became president, uh, he's put out a budget that calls for a 31% uh, cut, I think it's a 30.8% cut in a lot of the foreign assistance funds and the overall international affairs budget, which is the, called the 150 function in OMB speak. And that cut is, uh, represents a, a real serious challenge, I think, to folks in this room and the larger uh, development assistance community, folks who care about the U.S. role in the world whether you're coming from a, a liberal perspective, a conservative perspective, or just a generally an idealist or even a, a realist perspective, a cut of that magnitude from $50 billion down to a little bit north of $30 billion for both state and assistance issues is a huge challenge. It's almost impossible to imagine how we are going to implement a cut of that size without severely impacting our ability to do things around the world that's in our interests and in the interests of our allies and friends. So, this is, this is a terrific time to be paying attention to development issues, to be paying attention to what the administration is doing, how Congress reacts. There's a lot of folks who believe that the appropriators who ultimately determine the levels of funding overall for our uh, various government programs, particularly in this area in foreign assistance, are not gonna stand for a cut of that magnitude. So you could see, uh, even with a 30% cut proposed by the administration, it'll end up being somewhere around 12, 15, or 18 percent, the Congress will modulate that. There's also a lot of discussions from the administration about merging AID into state. It's unclear whether they're actually planning to do that. There's been some stories just this week about the possibility of reorganizing the international affairs budget, excuse me, reorganizing international affairs agencies in a more streamlined way. Uh, no one's made a case publicly for merging AID into the State Department, so it's it's difficult to kind of engage in a conversation, but that's something that's going on behind closed doors. Expect that issue to come out on the Hill in hearings and conversations and even legislation uh, in the next few weeks as the administration does its review of structures of government agencies and departments. They're going to look at taking AID, which has been the, the flagship foreign assistance agency for our government, and putting it in the State Department. Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? 
uh, there's, people have all kinds of different views. One of the things that strikes me about that issue is that in the last two administrations, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration, we've taken important steps to link AID more closely to the Defense Department. One of the things that we discover as the U.S. has a more expeditionary foreign policy and we're going into countries that, like Iraq and Afghanistan and other places, AID plays an increasing role dealing directly with the Defense Department. This is not something that AID is necessarily used to in the, in the 80s and 90s. We didn't do that as much. In Vietnam, of course, it was a different story. But in the 80s and 90s, we shied away from that kind of direct cooperation. That's on the, on the increase and has been for the last 15 years. You're going to lose some of that connectivity between aid officials and defense officials and our military if, I, I would fear, if aid is put within the State Department. Um, so that's, that's my thought. And so, so those, are, those are kind of the, the issues that are before us today. Let me just kind of offer another thesis here, which is while an interest in development issues and assistance and the U.S. role internationally is important and getting expertise on how to de develop programs that are effective and dealing with foreign cultures in an effective and appropriate way is important, do not be shy about American politics. Do not be afraid to become involved in your own political system. The decisions that are made about our international affairs interactions are made here in Washington. They're not made in, uh, you know, and here we're sitting here in a think tank where um, recommendations are, are being made to the administration, are being made to the Hill. Uh, be part of that conversation, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or a conservative or pro-Trump or anti-Trump, uh, be part of that conversation. Do not be shy about getting involved. The, uh, the opportunities to shape the future of what the U.S. is doing are huge right now. It's a time of great turmoil and ferment, and the, and the person who comes out and makes the most coherent argument for U.S. interests going forward is the one who's going to win the day. And there's no reason it can't be you. All right, that's my I cheerleader thesis. Well, thanks. And uh, while you think of some questions you might ask, uh, I'm going to take uh, the chair's prerogative and ask the first one. You talked a little bit about uh, the impact of the Hill on uh, USAID and U.S. Uh, assistance. How about the United Nations? What do you, what do you see happening uh, with uh, the various UN agencies in the future in, in, in terms of what you're hearing now? So I, um, so, so the, the UN uh, plays a, a critical role in the way the United States deals with the rest of the world in that it's a forum for conversations and diplomacy. It's an opportunity to advance U.S. interests. There are a number of programs that the U.N. Uh, provides around the world that are of value to the United States, and we fund them, and that some of them are critical. I would point to peacekeeping in particular, which, while it has some flaws, is a very effective way of uh, intervening in trouble spots around the world that don't have to involve the U.S. military. Having that kind of option at the U.N. is very important, and we need to, we need to uh, be good stewards of that tool. That means uh, some reform that probably is going to be taking place in the next, uh, during this administration. But it's also important to have decent budget support for those programs. Uh, frankly, the last administration um, went out and uh, had a vote in the UN Security Council that uh, severely impacted uh, Israel and the peace process in the Middle East in, uh, in my opinion, a negative way. It created a problem on the Hill that remains to this day, and there's, and there's going to be some funding struggles on the Hill that otherwise would not be there because of that vote in the UN Security Council. So I, I, I would, I would, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and be a little bit critical of the Obama administration for letting that happen there at the end of their eight years, which is something that the rest of us are gonna have to, have to deal with going forward. That's, that was not constructive or helpful. It was a big mistake in my opinion. People may differ, people have different views of, of uh, the peace process in the Middle East, but I think that's, that's something that's probably gonna likely impact budget levels and programs at the UN, in Congress in particular. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. Please state your name and your affiliation so the vice president knows who he's talking to. So, questions? This is never a shy group, so go ahead. I'm uh, Bo Tumas. I'm, I'm just a parent of somebody. <laughs> of her, actually. <laughs> Just a parent. The that That's the, the most microphone. important job there is. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm retired. I, I don't have a new career. So, but I do have a question. Um, 
You mentioned Bono speaking the Bible or the, the woman that came in, the actress that said, you know, the elephant is the symbol. How does AID, how would they use, for instance, your company to leverage the Defense Department tie to talk the language of the current administration? So one of the, one of the conversations, uh, or one of the things you'll hear in the kind of the broader conversation in Washington about international affairs and the State Department and AID and these kinds of things is that there's no constituency for State Department diplomacy or foreign assistance in, in that the money doesn't really benefit our communities. Whereas the Defense Department has bases in Alabama and in Tennessee and Kentucky and California, and they can say, you know, there's this local spending that's very important, and so those congressmen will come and defend the money for their bases or for the contractor in their state uh, so they keep getting budget support from the Department of Defense. Uh, I think that's total nonsense. There, there is a huge constituency for international affairs, both programs and policies in the United States from uh, different ethnic groups of people, let's, uh, let's say folks who fled uh, Eastern Europe under communism uh, during the last century tend to be a little more conservative, but they're very interested in the US playing a constructive role in Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, countries like that where they, where they came from, and they wanna see a robust US presence there because they know what Russia is capable of. Um, there's constituencies in faith-based groups and churches and synagogues and mosques for a variety of programs that we run that impact those communities here, uh, that use resources from those communities here to help related communities abroad. Um, and, there's, and there's also the business aspect. Uh, there's, the U.S. is 4% of the world's population. We are 22% of the world's economy. The things that happen around the world have a disproportionate effect on our way of life. They can't help but do that. So the U.S. playing a role in helping countries develop and stabilizing um, chaotic situations has a direct impact on our way of life here in the United States. Sometimes it's a, it's a little hard to see, but the U.S. being a global leader matters for our ability to have companies that make money, that import and export, that construct things that other countries will buy that makes us more money. Our, our lifestyle is directly tied to the U.S. playing a leadership role in the world. So I, so I think that the, the, the folks in this room and the part of the larger international affairs community should not be shy about talking about how important it is for our country that we have these programs. It's important for us as Americans, for the things that we care about, for our interests, to have a robust foreign assistance funding. Yeah, just to add, I, I'm always puzzled, having spent my career in either mostly in AID and, and some in the State Department, that people think about 20% of our budget goes to foreign aid, when it's basically less than 1%. Uh, it's it, it's uh, where that the misconception comes from. Is, is, well, is, I, I, have, is I, think I, know, I think I know where it comes from. Uh, so it's true that our 150 account, the 50 billion or so that we spend on State Department and foreign assistance, is about 1% of the budget, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I think a lot of people see our military presence around the world as also being a form of foreign assistance. You know, the U.S. Navy, uh, in its, with its carrier groups and other things around the world, is the biggest provider of stability in the world. And we spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year on that. That's, in effect, bro very broadly speaking, a form of foreign assistance. So I would actually argue that it's not just the... Uh, not just the 150 account, the State Department and the Foreign Assistance Budget, it's also the 050 account, the Defense Department spending that is actually also a huge part of U.S. global leadership and in a way can be construed as us helping the rest of the world. Uh, that makes sense. Because I was thinking we ought to start a campaign uh, that uh, limits U.S. foreign assistance to 3 percent of the budget. <laughs> and that sounds pretty good. It would be a tripling <laughs> or a doubling of the budget. But You might slide that one by. Yeah, that, no one's taken that one up yet. I've offered it a few places. Anyone else? I can't believe it. Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Eagle Spielberg. So I'm from Seattle and uh, co-founder of a group working on food, water, and energy nexus, that uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. A lot of talk about developing infrastructure here in the United States. Uh, we're anticipating, I suspect, a trillion dollar initiative at some point. But I'm wondering what our role ought to be internationally. Uh, I note that China, for example, is making a multi-billion dollar commitment to support infrastructure development in the developing world. 
uh, I, where should we be when it comes to helping the developing countries to develop their food system, their water system, sanitation system, their transport system, communication system? I mean, it's all about helping that part of the world, the bottom of the pyramid, to come up. And I'm just wondering if what you think about what our role ought to be uh, going forward. So uh, I, I think those are, those are issues that we have to discuss. But we also need to put in the context of what's, what are the conditions on the ground that are going to allow us to make that kind of investment. Is it the kind of place where if we spend a lot of money developing these projects, it's going to wither away and not actually have that much utility going forward? Or is the local community going to make sacrifice, the sacrifices necessary to have a successful infrastructure? The, the reason the Millennium Challenge Corporation was started during the Bush administration and sustained during the Obama administration largely uh, was to assist those countries that are willing to make the smart policy decisions and the tough political decisions to have an appropriate environment for investment. And maybe they just haven't reached quite the level of developing private sources for that kind of funding, and, but they're close. The Millennium Challenge Corporation was set up for exactly that situation, and I think, and I think we need to look at that a little closer. It's been, I would argue, a little bit underfunded for the last administration. You could probably use a little more money uh, to, to look at exactly those kinds of situations. But I think we should be careful about where we go, and we should invest in countries where, they're, where, they're, where it's clear that they share our values about what's going to be a sound investment, and it's a place where we're not going to spend a lot of money only to see it wither away in a few years and not be used. Yeah, one thing that would be interesting, because uh, I worked on the Hill before your time, a decade before, wow. uh, in the 70s, for a guy named Don Fraser from Minnesota. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff, members, interact with AID and the State Department in, in setting policy and setting sure. priorities and just how that interaction uh, takes place? So we could, we could spend a couple hours talking about how uh, Congress uh, interacts with with just just the U.S. Agency for International Development. I think it, uh, there's some important things to think about. The Appropriations Committee uh, legislates every year, either through an uh, through an appropriations bill or a continuing resolution. They actually write a law that will continue to fund foreign assistance. So really, they're kind of the lead on uh, spending issues in the U.S. at the U.S. Agency for Inter International Development and other foreign aid components of the U.S. government. There's a subcommittee called the State, uh, State and Foreign Operations mm -hmm. and Related Programs Subcommittee, or SFOPS. That SFOPS subcommittee, which is chaired by Lindsey Graham in the Senate and um, uh, Hal Rogers in the House, make the actual decisions about funding levels for various programs and agencies. They every year, and so they they're really play a critical role. And they also, in addition to, to passing legislation that will determine funding levels, are then the recipients of, um, on a, almost on a daily basis, suggestions from the administration about changes in spending or policy or programs. They're called congressional notifications. And these congressional notifications will come up to both the Appropriations Subcommittee that I mentioned, and also the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate and the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House, for approval. In other words, uh, the administration will say, I know you, essentially they say, I know you gave us a budget that said we would spend a billion dollars on malaria, but we actually want to spend 1.1 billion on malaria, and we're going to take this 100 million from a place you don't know about, and we're just going to spend it on malaria if that's okay with you. And, uh, and the Congress will say, uh, hold on, please come up here and explain <coughs> what you're going to spend it on and where that money is coming from before we say okay. So there's this informal it is in, it's informal in that it is not required by law and there's no statute that you can point to that kind of dictates this process. But essentially the administration has to go to its key interlocutors on the Hill and that are these two subcommittees and the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate and the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House and get essentially sign off on changes to the program through the year. Now at the end of the year, you know, they'll get a new appropriation that largely reflect some of those changes, so then the next year there'll be other kind of changes that they're going to seek. But it's, it's an almost daily or weekly process of folks from AID and other agencies going in, and the State Department going up to the Hill and briefing on these changes and getting approval or not for, for changes in the program, different funding levels, new programs, things like that as things crop up, as there's an emergency that has to be dealt with, uh, they will send up a notification, we want to spend an extra you know, half billion dollars on refugees coming out of Syria, is that okay? And then Congress, sometimes if there are concerns, they'll negotiate some changes and then 
they'll be able to go forward. It's, it's a rare occurrence when one of those notifications is put on hold indefinitely. I think an example might be certain kinds of assistance to the Palestinians have been on hold for years over uh, you know, Hamas and terrorism issues. Uh, and then there have been some, maybe pa some Pakistan funds have been put on hold uh, for a while over concerns about what they're doing in Afghanistan. But those are, those are rare. Generally speaking, around the world in, our, in the billions of dollars we spend, there's an ongoing conversation between USAID and the Hill to get kind of this informal approval process, usually at the staff level, it rarely goes up to the member level, uh, but that, that goes on all the time. And so, so in, as you're thinking about careers in development and in assistance and in US uh, international affairs, being on Capitol Hill in one of those subcommittees or working for a member that's on one of those subcommittees or on one of those committees, you can play a huge you can, you can make a huge difference in what the U.S. is doing abroad just because of that process alone, this notification process, this notification and approval process. Good question. Hello, my name is Anna Back, and I'm from the I'm a trainee at the Danish Embassy. I work with development and climate in the team, um, and I need a bit of career advice. So I was thinking what you were thinking about where to, whether to start off a career in development uh, in the developing countries on the ground following the projects versus being in an international environment uh, with act a lot of different actors such as uh, Washington, D.C. Um, that's, that's a great question, and I, and I feel like I'm not necessarily the best person to answer that. I'll just tell you, I've spent my entire career in Washington. Uh, I've never... Uh, lived abroad for more than a couple of weeks. Frankly, um, I, I can't describe myself as an expert on any foreign culture or anything like that. There are, there are people in the development uh, world who do that and are incredibly effective and do terrific things f uh, for the country they're in and for U.S. foreign policy and national security interests. Uh, I think that's absolutely something that is of value. I will tell you, you can also be a homebody like me and uh, stay in Washington for... <laughs> 27, 28 years, and, and work on some stuff that's very, that, that makes a difference, and that is interesting and keeps you engaged constructively and, and, has, and can have a tremendous impact. I think my point would be, you don't have to go into the field to make a difference. You can do that, and it can be very rewarding, and there are people who, who are very good at that in this room who have made a difference for the U.S. abroad. Uh, I'm sitting next to one of them. I see some other faces who have done amazing things. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can, you can work here uh, and be part of the policy conversation in Washington and have, and have an impact on the way things are around the world, I think. I think you absolutely need both uh, to make it work in the right way. If you're, uh, just another question, what would be your sort of profile, the kind of person who works on a committee staff or a, a member's personal staff. So I, I have, uh, again, I could talk about this for a couple hours. As, as the staff director uh, at Foreign Relations, which was my last job on the Hill, uh, I hired the people who were, who were working on this stuff. And so I saw different personalities and different characteristics and different abilities. And it's always, it's always good to hire the smart person, uh, the person who's got a good academic career and has showed some competence. But, you, but what you really need at the end of the day on Capitol Hill to make a difference is you need an entrepreneurial spirit. And you need to be proactive and willing to think a little bit outside the box about what, you've, what you're being fed by the giant uh, blob that is uh, Washington, and in particular, sometimes, sometimes, you say bureaucracy or the State Department bureaucracy. You need to be able to yeah. kind of look at what they tell you with a little, a little bit of uh, skepticism and see opportunities. Um, and so, the most valuable characteristic, I think, for, for a young person who's interested in making a difference is, is be entrepreneurial, be a self-starter, have ideas, and pursue them. And do not let people tell you, I mean, unless it's your boss, uh, that you can't do that. You, you, need to, you need to get out of your comfort zone and, and get out there and make a difference. Um, and forgive me for saying good things about Newt Gingrich, but in, when the Republicans took over the House of Representatives in 1995, after being in the wilderness for 40 years, one of the best things Speaker Gingrich did was say, we're gonna be entrepreneurial. I wanna raise up folks who have ideas and who are willing to make proposals, and we will get them before Congress and the American people, and if they're good, we'll turn them into law. 
it, was, it didn't always work, but when it did, it was, it was amazing. Uh, be proactive, be active, get out there, have some ideas, don't believe what other people tell you necessarily. You know, get out there and, and, and kind of impose your will on the system. It's gonna, it's gonna make a difference, and it's gonna, generally speaking, gonna be a very positive difference. Hi, good, um, good morning. Thank you for that very insightful um, introduction of, about yourself. I'm Ava, and I'm from the Philippines, and I just recently arrived in, in the US, so very fresh off the boat. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so the Philippines is one of the, you know, the recipients of development assistance from the US, and um, also with help from the Defense Department through, I mean, through the, um, natural disasters that's been happening in the country, so very thankful for that. Um, so there are a lot of good things that have been happening in, in Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific region, um, because of development assistance from, from the US. How much of that is, has reached the, new, the, the locals in, in, the, in the US? Um, so you that mean, do you mean news of that? Yeah, of yeah, those good that the, like uh, good good things. The result, the in, the impact of those development assistance, for example, in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, women and girls being assisted. How much of that reaches the the hill in the local conversation, so that the people here can push that there's no need to cut the foreign assistance. Uh, well, that's, that's a great question. So I, I think the word uh, of success in assistance is muddled. It's a little bit muddled in Washington. And there are, uh, there are folks, my old boss at AID, uh, Andrew Natsios, uh, who's a good Republican, will come in and tell you that development assistance absolutely works. He will have great examples. I tend to believe him. Uh, he's a very credible messenger to me. Uh, and and he and he will and he will uh, argue with anyone that assistance programs are effective. There will be other voices in Washington who will say, you know what, it's not that effective. We don't get that much of a bang for the buck. We can cut back and still uh, have some tools that we can use. So there's and and they'll poo-poo what are the successes abroad. Uh, so so there are voices that have to be answered on on the question you're asking. It's not, it is not a clear message. There are other, there are other views that are, that are out there. So, so I think when we're, when we're talking about the budget, it's important to talk about the successes and, and some of the successes you're talking about. It's also important to put our tools and, and programs in the context of US national interests. In other words, it's, it's one thing just to say they're effective. You have to say why that success actually matters to the United States budget when we're spending a trillion dollars, half a trillion dollars more than we're taking in every year. We have a budget deficit that's very serious. Um, and, and so just having a successful program is, doesn't necessarily merit continued funding. It has to be something that the US is going to invest in in a tough budget environment. So you have to package up the success stories with an explanation for why things that are happening in Southeast Asia where China is expanding its influence matter to the US. Do we care that the Chinese system uh, from Beijing is going to have more influence in places like Vietnam and the Philippines and Thailand uh, going forward, or should we try to advance U.S. values and interest in those places? That's, that's an important, huge, important policy question for the United States. Uh, I think it's notable that the last four presidents, last three presidents that were, uh, actually the last four presidents that were elected in the United States, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, all campaigned kind of on the isolationist side of this question. In other words, what's good abroad is not necessarily what's good for the United States. We need to focus on things at home. Bill Clinton said it's the economy, stupid. George W. Bush said we're not going to do nation building anymore. Barack Obama um, uh, pulled back uh, U.S. military intervention abroad after our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Donald Trump certainly campaigned on uh, nation first and not world first. So, so all of these successful presidential candidates have campaigned on basically an isolationist platform. Once in office, however, their policies changed. Every single one of them became an internationalist. 
uh, was George W. Bush. It was 9-11 that turned him into an internationalist. Uh, Barack Obama, I think, was actually a little more muted. Not sure. He was certainly for international law and the UN and things like that. Not necessarily as internationalist as some of the other folks. Bill Clinton eventually uh, intervened in uh, the Balkans um, and became more of an internationalist very reluctantly. Uh, I suspect you're going to see this current administration move from isolationism to internationalism as well. It's the natural order of things. U.S. interests require that we be engaged around the world. So, you, so when we're talking about the international affairs budget, I think we need to think about the context of an administration and a Congress that are going to be moving from this isolationist approach, broad, extremely broadly speaking, to more of an international approach. And so you need to put it in the context of, here's why this matters to the U.S. Here's why this matters f to be very political about it to voters in Wisconsin, in uh, Michigan, in Ohio, and Pennsylvania, because I guarantee you those will, again, be the battlegrounds for the presidential election that's going to happen in 2020 in this country. So if you can explain why good things in the Philippines and Vietnam and Thailand and other places in Southeast Asia are good for voters in Michigan, you have won the lottery. And, and you will be able to do wonderful things. That's, that's going to be the trick, is explaining how these programs can matter for American politics. Hello, Luke Perry from Utica College in New York. Uh, the notion of public service has been really uh, under assault and become unpopular over the last few decades, both in terms of electoral politics and career civil servants. I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on why do you think that's happened and what could possibly uh, be done to help address that? Uh, it's a good question. I, I think I would disagree with the premise a little bit. Um, I, I think after 9-11, there was a huge surge in young Americans in particular wanting to serve their country, uh, either in the military or in civilian agencies abroad or at home. Uh, there's, uh, and, and I think that's a phenomenal thing, and, and we, have to, we have to note that. I think there's been some, you know, as there always is, there's always criticism of the youngest generation. You know, the millennials are getting a lot of flack from, from boomers oh. and uh, <laughs> Gen Xers, and uh, I'm not sure where you are. Yeah, so uh, we, we tend to give the millennials grief. We shouldn't. Um, it's millennials who are in harm's way right now in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and in Syria and who are carrying out uh, assistance programs in dangerous areas uh, and, and in harm's way either in uniform or working in programs that are in dangerous places. And we, sh and we should honor that commitment and, and I think acknowledge that there are actually plenty of our cohort who are, who are very interested in public service. Um, I think the last campaign was pretty nasty. Uh, it's certainly the nastiest one I've seen. Uh, it does seem to be a trend. I wouldn't read too much into it. I don't think it's necessarily emblematic of what the American people think. You know, what people tweet, even if that person goes on to become president, it's not necessarily reflective of where most Americans are. I think Americans have great respect for the military in particular, for people who are willing to serve uh, in difficult places and willing to do dangerous things for their country and for, and for our values. So, so I, I kind of think that while there's been a little bit of backlash um, over, over larger policy issues and it kind of shakes out, it looks like a little bit like we're critical of public service, I think in fact th there is, there's a lot of respect in, in certain areas and, and broadly speaking there's still a good reservoir of Americans who feel strongly about their country and about public service and think it's of value. Over here. Thank you, Mr. Munson. Um, my name is Christian Domas. I'm a graduate student at Catholic University uh, in economic development. You kind of alluded to this a couple questions ago, but with this potential budget cut that's going to happen um, for foreign assistance, what can happen on the USA, US policy side in terms to try and make that money more effective and efficient yep. if those cuts occur? Obviously, a lot happens on you know who's implementing the projects and on that side, but what can happen on, on the US side to really trying to make sure that if these buts, budget cuts happen, um, that we can still have an impact on the world? Uh, that's a great question. So, one, so the, the budget question, um, the administration is, of course, uh, at the beginning of a negotiation with Congress about how much money to spend on these things. And their initial negotiating ploy is, is uh, 
I would say not plausible, but they may say the most plausible argument for cutting back on these programs, knowing that the Hill is going to put a lot of that money back in. They zeroed out family planning money. They know the Democrats will insist on there being a robust family planning program of some kind. Uh, they, they cut back on a lot of global health programs that fight um, various diseases. They know that Congress, in a bipartisan fashion, will add that money back in. So they, they like, it's the beginning of a negotiation, right? So, and, uh, and at the end, there will be some cuts. I, I, I'm, I think it's perfectly fair to cut the, the 150 account in line with where other, what other budget cuts are across the government, and it's probably the responsible thing to do in a time of budget deficits. I'm a little bit Republican that way. Uh, on, on the broader policy questions, there is this discussion of restructuring, and there's and there's kind of a knee-jerk reaction among some folks that you should that aid doesn't that aid as a as an agency doesn't really work, and there are huge problems, and we should just put it in the State Department. Well, my my view, after having been in Washington for only 28 years, is that if there's a place that's not managed well in terms of uh, kind of effectiveness and accountability and programming, it's probably the State Department that is not very, that's not their functionality that is very good. If they're very good at diplomacy and working with other cultures, they're not good managers. Uh, I think putting aid into state is a mistake. Uh, if you're trying to solve management problems within the agency, that's not the way to solve them. The way to solve them is to reimagine the U.S. International, the U.S. Uh, agency for International Development as an agency that works with both state and defense, that is, uh, that is the best assistance agency in the world, that is fully accountable, that is a good, uh, that is a good steward of American taxpayer dollars, and has accountability mechanisms that are world class. That's not quite true right now. We need to improve them. Uh, so you need a more robust management structure in a foreign aid agency, and then we should be working very closely with the Defense Department and the State Department to ensure that the programs we're doing are in our national interest. There's an important role for kind of the longer term development programs, I do believe, but if you don't get that first part right of having an assistance agency that is aligned with U.S. national interests, you can't do the development function. So we need to fix that first thing. Uh, I'm hopeful that interactions between the administration and the Hill will lead to that, uh, and, then we, and then we can kind of address some of these other questions. But I think. So the, so the budget will be uh, probably half of the cut that we're looking at now, hopefully a little bit less than that. And, 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 and I think what we should all look for and hope for and advocate for is a conversation among policymakers that leads to a more effective uh, foreign assistance agency. Did you? One, I, I, as you talk about the budget process, I guess one of the questions I'm sort of interested in and get your thoughts on, are there gonna, is there going to be a budget or is it going to be a continuing resolution for? Yeah. So uh, is there going to be a budget? Uh, I, think, I don't think we've had a real budget resolution pass in decades. Uh, will there be a full appropriations process for the rest of FY17? Probably not. It'll either, at best, it'll be... Uh, there's a great Washington term, a cromnibus. Anybody know what a cromnibus <laughs> is? A cromnibus is a CR and, an, and, and then an omnibus. So the CR is the continuing resolution. In other words, we'll just keep doing what we're doing now because we can't politically make any changes for part of the government. And then an omnibus, which is real uh, spending changes for other parts of the government, which of course means it's not an omnibus. It's a you know, partial bus. So it's really a cr partial bus. Um, so at best, there'll be some sort of cromnibus. It's possible there's just a CR that continues for the rest of the year, uh, and you ha literally have to follow the uh, voices on the Hill on a minute-by-minute -minute basis to say whether or not, which, which direction that's going. And I haven't done it for the last hour because I've been sitting here. Uh, so I think, you know, this week, the, the funding ends at the end of this week. Congress is probably going to kick it for another week or two, and then they'll figure out what they're going to do for the rest of the year. And then the, the budget proposal that we've been talking about, which is for FY18, uh, will be litigated and discussed uh, by those same committees after they've kind of resolved this rest of FY17 question. That yeah, probably makes sense. It's a lot yeah. of fun to follow if you want. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you very much. I'm Sergio Martinez, a student and graduate student at the Catholic University of America. I want to ask you, in the light of the, of the cut on the international aid from the U.S. government, 
I'm wondering how does this translate in the in new dynamics in the international aid ecosystem? So how will it be the change in roles between you know all the organizations that are included? And also if will this have a particular consequence in the governance structure or how for example, if, are we going to see new leadership roles emerging, or what will be new roles in, in that matter? Thank you. Uh, it's a good question. I, th I think in addition to there being ferment in the United States over a lot of these questions, other countries are clearly going through a review of their approach internationally. Brexit leaps to mind. The French election, uh, everyone's saying Marine Le Pen can't win. Uh, boy, I'd be watching that closely. Uh, uh, other, you know, Great Britain and Canada over time have restructured their aid programs to be a little more in line with their national security policy. Uh, there, there's, I, I would argue that with the World Health Organization response to the Ebola crisis of a few years ago, there's clearly a need for someone to look at that system and see if it's um, fulfilling its, the functionality it's supposed to fulfill. I think there's, there's, it's a time of change, and as the U.S. goes through its own internal dynamic, once that's resolved in some manner and folks are in place executing policies, they're very going to quickly realize that they also need to engage around the world in these other changes that are taking place because they're going to impact on our ability to do what we want to do also. So it's, it's you know, while we're really kind of inwardly focused right now, you make a great point, I think, that at a, very quickly, we're going to turn, you know, we're going to turn to the rest of the world and realize we, we need to engage in a constructive way in all of these other questions because they impact us. Much like uh, the administration when they came in after running America First pro uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, campaign, realized, you know, we have North Korea to deal with. Uh, we have to figure out a sensible way forward with, with Russia, despite what we said during the campaign. And some other things, you, you, reality hits pretty quickly. So I think we need to, we need to address our, con our kind of parochial issues here, sort them out as effectively as possible, and then begin to engage the rest of the world in, in exactly the things you're talking about. I get, no, go ahead. So uh, you said that the swamp here makes all the policy when it comes to development. So if you wanted to impact uh, the development of this policy going forward, uh, what forums, what platforms, what mechanisms would you want to connect with or engage with if you wanted to really be involved in the conversation and shape policy? It's a great question. By the way, swamps are critical to the global ecosystem. If a lake doesn't have a swamp, it gets to be really polluted. The swamp is what cleans everything out. Uh, we should like swamps, uh, having lived in the swamp for 20 years. Uh, I feel like Shrek. Um, Congress is the place where it matters. Congress, at the end of the day, these programs are funded and authorized by Congress. So the place where it matters is the representatives of the American people. You have to go, again, to the earlier question, you need to go make the case that infrastructure abroad matters to the U.S. here. And it matters to, you know, Joe the plumber in Ohio who's, you know, worried about whether he's got enough work to last for the rest of the month. Why, why does infrastructure projects in Egypt matter to him? You, ha you do have to have that explanation. You have to be able to go to co uh, Congress and make the case to people who are up for re-election. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly awkward uh, system. It is, it is frustrating. It is occasionally enervating. It can be uh, the lowest common denominator, but it is by far the best system in the world. So it's designed that way. It is democracy. We need to make the case to the American people and their representatives that these programs matter. And, and then, and, and, and I would argue, it, it has good results. We've ha the U.S. has been the leader in uh, assisting the developing world for generations. We have led the way. The international structures came out of Washington. <coughs> they came out of conversations between Congress and the White House uh, in, in the aftermath of World War II and, and the years that followed. So, so this has worked before. It has been working. It will work in the future. We need, the important thing is really to be engaged and to not shy away from, as I was earlier saying, don't, don't be shy about being you know, lowercase political. Talk to politicians. The politicians are the policymakers. That's our system. We don't rely on a panel of experts. We rely on the people that the American people elected. It's, 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 it's actually great. And they're all right here. 
You know, they all work in basically six buildings or seven buildings down the street. You can go see them Tuesday through Thursday. It's, uh, you know, that's what we're doing here. <laughs> Good point. What, could you talk a little bit about the difference? I only worked in the House side years back, but you've worked in the House and in the Senate. The yeah. difference between the House and Senate. The, so uh, they are different. I started in the House, and I, I think of myself as really as a, as a House person. The House is more, um, you know, uh, legislatively and in terms of floor procedure, the House is a dictatorship. Whoever the speaker is gets to decide what happens. He or mm -hmm. she decides what the amendments are. He or she decides what bills will come up. Uh, having said that, though, the House is freewheeling. There's 435 members. If you're a young person, if you're 22 right out of college and you get hired in an office and you demonstrate competence and hustle, you will quickly rise to the top uh, and, and be in a position to influence a member of Congress or a committee or a bill or, or part of the process. In the Senate, it's a little more, it's a little more ossified. There's, there's, a there's only 100 offices, uh, which is, of course, vastly fewer than the House. They're, they're more hierarchical. Uh, there's 20 or 30 people in each office. Uh, the younger folks tend to be, uh, as Charlie knows, uh, the, the younger folks tend to be put in the back in a not well lit area and occasionally you, you, know, you throw a sandwich in there and hope that they don't uh, hurt the adults. Um, it's, it's harder to kind of rise as a young person out of a Senate office into a position where, you, where you're making a difference. In the House, it's, it's, it's what happens. There's 25 year old chiefs of staff, there's 30 year old chiefs of staff. There are uh, you know, legislative directors who are 24 who are, who are guiding policy. There are members who are 30 years old who are making a difference. You know, you can, by the way, don't, don't be shy about running for office either and making a difference. Uh, it's, it's doable. <coughs> um, so so the, the, uh, having said all that, the Senate is, particularly in this area, more powerful and more relevant in foreign policy generally. The, the Senate has a huge role. And if, and if the White House loses the Senate, it's going to be vastly less effective in its ability to implement a foreign policy or national security <laughs> strategy, which I, which I would argue is, was one of the frustrations with the Obama administration is the, he kind of lost a, a real constructive relationship with the Senate after the first couple of years. That, if that relationship had been better and stronger and there had been more of a conversation, I think President Obama would have been more successful than he was. Uh, I think we should look at the, the current president, see how he's doing with with the Senate, is he having good conversations? I think he invited the entire Senate over today to talk about North Korea. Um, that's that's going to be an interesting mm -hmm. thing to watch. So, Congress. Yes, that's the difference between the House and the Senate. <laughs> okay. Now, I, in the, in the interest of time, I know everybody else is busy. Please join me in thanking Wes for being here today.